Hi, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 72 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. I'm delighted to, to say today's presenter is George Howler, CEO of Safe Food 360. And George is going to be talking about validation of cleaning programs, a very important key ingredient of GFSI uh, standards now. Uh, how effective is your cleaning? If you're doing it, you want to make sure that it's effective. Um, just to say, today's webinar and the Food Safety Fridays webinar program is sponsored by Safe Food 360, Trace Analytics, AIB International and Metal of Toledo. These kind organizations help to bring these uh, short bursts of training to you each week and get you uh, some education and a certificate of attendance to put in your CPD file and show those pesky auditors. Um, just to draw your attention, a lot of you already uh, know uh, the regulars, you're chatting in the sidebar saying hello. Feel free throughout to type your questions and comments in there. Uh, I'm sure some of the more learned members will actually answer as they usually do, but we will pick up the questions and uh, we'll have some time for Q&A later. Uh, just to say also that today's webinar is being recorded. I follow up with an email uh, an hour or two after this uh, live webinar with the recording, a copy of the slide deck and the certificate. So if you get called away for a few moments, don't worry, uh, you will catch up on it later. So uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce you to George Howlett. Uh, again, he's CEO at Seifu360. Welcome, George. Good afternoon, Simon. How are you? Good, good. Nice to have you with us. Um, we've got... Uh, over 1,850 people registered for today's webinar, which is fantastic. Um, yes. So you hold actually the first and second record. <laughs> so I don't know if it's you personally or the, the actual uh, topic title itself or what, but whatever, you, you've you won the, the prize already, George. So no, no, uh, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure whatsoever, George. Okay, if you want to get your slides ready, George, I'll let uh, the ladies and gents know about uh, next week's uh, offering. Um, okay. Next week, uh, we're, we're having a break from Food Safety Fridays, actually. We have a Food Safety Fridays free webinar in two weeks, and that's Robert Rogers' uh, insurable, Ensuring Readable Data Lock Code Information. Uh, from Metal Toledo, Robert Rogers. Uh, but next week, we actually have root cause identification and problem solving tools from Vladimir Sachinsky. That's a four hour one. It's paid actually at $97 per person. And that covers tools such as SWOT, SWOT analysis, FMEA, Ishikawa, 8D. So tools that you can use to help plan and set objectives and prioritize help uh, with your HACCP uh, risk analysis, and also for problem solving and project, uh, uh, continuous improvement projects. So a lot, a lot of tools there that you can, um, you can use. And Vladimir will be giving practical examples of how you can actually use those tools with real, real life examples in, in the food industry. So uh, help you to apply them to your process and products. Uh, George, uh, can you click the, share icon at the moment we're just getting your logo on so um yeah i think we're coming up now okay so i'll disappear i'll be back for the q a later but for now i'll hand you over to george okay george hey simon thank you uh, so good afternoon everybody and uh, thanks for taking the time to join us today uh, the subjects under discussion is validation of cleaning programs and uh, just before we start out on this presentation, just to make the point, guys, there's quite a lot of detail involved in validating cleaning programs, um, which is contained in the slide deck. However, I won't be dwelling too long on any particular slides. Uh, the deck will be made available later on, um, as, we're, as well as the additional resources, uh, such as a white paper um, to uh, support what we're doing today. Okay, so I'm just going to... Uh, try to advance the slide deck. Hmm. I mean, I'm not sure if you're there, but uh, yeah, just make sure you're in your PowerPoint when you click in advance rather than the hopefully not the webinar. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Perfect. 
So guys, uh, just to point out, first of all, um, if you want to obtain the white paper and the tools that I'll be demonstrating uh, during the presentation, you can find them at safefoods360.com, free resources. Um, so we have a quite detailed uh, white paper to support the slide deck, which provides a lot more information and detail than uh, you'll see today. Uh, so good idea is to spend a bit of time reading through that if you are looking to undertake a full validation of cleaning. In addition, you will have the tools, which includes a capability tool, which we'll be talking about in a moment. Okay, so just to introduce this whole area of validation and cleaning, uh, HACCP, you know, since its inception, has always required validation, but has restricted it mostly to uh, CCPs or critical control points. Now, that, of course, made a lot of sense because they're the points at which things can go wrong, and it's reasonable to assume that th that can have an impact. So making sure that your controls are up to the job uh, was important, is important, and validation kind of has lived around that space for a long time. However, in more recent times, and in particular with the revision of global food standards, uh, introduction of FISMA to a degree, uh, we've seen the expansion of validation as a tool uh, to cover things such as prerequisites, uh, operational prerequisites, and preventative controls as well. Now, cleaning, as we all know, is a, a core part of that whole preventative control environment. And these standards now require specifically that cleaning is conducted and based upon a full assessment of risk. So we'll also discuss the importance of cleaning because uh, to understand how to uh, validate a cleaning program, uh, you first need to understand what cleaning is. Um, what are the ingredients that go in to make for an effective cleaning program? So we will cover those um, as well um, before we get on to the validation aspects. Okay, um, some of the reasons why you may want to clean a plant, uh, just, uh, obviously it's required by law uh, in most jurisdictions. Uh, your customers uh, will almost certainly require you to do that. Um, it's a basic fundamental requirement to produce safe food products. So it's virtually impossible to produce safe foods, even with fantastic hassle plans, unless you have a good basic cleaning program in place. So the things that go in to make for an effective cleaning program or a cleaning program with a high degree of efficacy are things such as your soils. So that would be the, you know, the, the ingredients, the food that would come in contact with certain surfaces. Um, the other elements that we need to consider when it comes to cleaning is what we call the substrate. And that would be the, the surfaces themselves, which the foods um, are in contact with, which combine to, and which needs to be removed from that surface. The other main element is, of course, energy. Uh, you cannot achieve any sort of work without an energy input, and cleaning is essentially uh, a, a work type of activity. The final thing is reactions. So we have a lot of physio and chemical reactions that take place to achieve proper cleaning. And these four elements combined uh, usually make up most cleaning programs. Just very quickly um, on those elements, then we have soils. So that would include things such as fats and oils, greases, proteins, carbohydrates, all the main constituents of food products. But it also could include um, other um, products of, say, processes like corrosion or the accumulation of lime scale, <clears throat> excuse me, perhaps from water that's been used in the process. Uh, substrates are the materials of construction for the uh, equipment that are used, so conveyors, machines, uh, stainless steel work, things of that nature. Obviously, stainless steel is the most desirable because it is inert and is less likely to corrode than so other metals and mild steels. Energy is the driver behind cleaning, so you need to put energy in in some shape or form. That can be physical, it can be energy in the form of heat, 
um, or indeed chemical energy. And, and typically most cleaning programs would include a combination of those um, to achieve the proper effect. The reactions then, these chemical and physical reactions, they uh, take place, they're important uh, because you need to uh, you know, obtain the physical transition or movement of uh, various uh, solids of matter. So, you know, for example, things such as wetting, penetration, emulsification. So these are all things, if you get into a lot of detail about cleaning, they're terms that you want to use and understand. I'm just putting them up there purely for information purposes, guys. Um, just so you are aware of them. A couple of uh, terms that are important. Uh, we use them every day in food manufacturing. Uh, sometimes uh, we may not understand fully what they mean, but um, we'll take detergent as being the first one. And the detergent is really designed to remove solids. It's, um, it's designed to lift grease, you know, dissolve grease, and just physically get it off that substrate surface so that you can then remove it. So not too dissimilar to your uh, washing up liquid at home, uh, really designed to get, get in there and, and remove the vast majority of the, um, of the uh, soils. Sanitizer is also used as well. Uh, it's used in different ways by different companies and in different jurisdictions. Typically it's used to describe a chemical which has both a detergent and the sterilant in it as well. Disinfection is really what the term we use to describe um, the removal of bacteria um, from surfaces. So the detergents just gets the heavy lifting work done, and then we come in with a disinfectant to kill uh, or to certainly uh, achieve a significant reduction in the number of bacteria and other microorganisms that may be present. Just to make a brief point that sterilization in itself, which is the uh, complete removal uh, of these microorganisms, um, is typically not required in most food processes, can be quite an expensive process, uh, and uh, generally speaking is not required. Okay, so what is validation? Um, so very, very important point is uh, a lot of people get validation and verification confused. Um, so we're just going to spend a little bit of time on discussing what validation is and uh, put it in context. And according to Codex Alimentarius, um, validation is a process where you obtain evidence that a control measure, or indeed a combination of control measures, if they're properly implemented, are capable of controlling a hazard. And that's very important. It's a bit long-winded, guys, I, I admit, but it is important. So really what it's saying is that validation is basically checking that what you're doing is capable of achieving the desired outcome. So, for example, in cleaning, the objective of a cleaning program may be to, say, remove residual allergens from the line in the middle of a cleaning changeover. So validation is checking that that cleaning procedure is in fact capable of doing that. Uh, and you would be surprised, I mean, the number of food companies that would overlook that kind of very obvious, but very important point. So validation essentially is your proof. It's your objective evidence, your scientific evidence, that the cleaning method, as you've defined it, is capable of in fact achieving the objective. Removal of bacteria to a certain level, removal of allergens or, um, or, for example, the removing of residual chemicals that may be present. So it's very important that you understand what your objective is. Now, that's validation, and it's different from verification, because verification asks a different question. Verification is asking, are we doing what we say we are doing? So are we cleaning the line according to the procedure as documented? And the answer to that question is simply a yes or no. What it's not concerned with what verification is not concerned with is whether or not what you're doing is good enough. It's simply just asking the question, are you doing what you say you're doing? The validation takes it a step forward and it asks a different question. It says, is what you're doing sufficient to achieve your objectives, which is a clean and safe production environment? 
So I hope that explanation is clear, guys. Uh, it's really important um, to understand the distinction between the two terms. Okay, so we want to set about the exercise of validating a cleaning program. We want to check that the cleaning program is up to the job. It can actually get that desired result, that reduction in bacteria, that clean plant. And I'm going to present to you a, a standard model, which you now, uh, and you know, Hold on to your seats. That contains 13 steps. But don't worry, guys. Uh, this model I'm presenting or this uh, process of validation is really uh, all the bells and whistles. And most companies won't utilize all these steps. But I'm, I, I put them in just to make sure that what we're presenting is comprehensive. You, of course, will adapt this to your own particular needs and your own local requirements. <clears throat> Just going to make a general point that uh, any validation of any preventative control, and that includes cleaning, has to be logical and clear, guys. And you need to operate with your outcomes in mind. What are you trying to achieve? And if you get those two things right, that's almost half the job done. Okay, so step one is establish a validation team. So not dissimilar to doing HACCP, you need to put a team together to do this validation of your cleaning. I would suggest, and it would make sense, that that team should, in fact, be your HACCP team. Um, under FISMA, it could be the uh, qualified individu individual. It would make sense that that person uh, fulfills that role, or certainly a key member of the validation team. Next step, then, is to define and document your validation methodology. And, in fact, this is what we're actually looking at now. And it's good practice to just write it, write it down somewhere as a procedure, this is how we actually, in fact, validate our cleaning programs. Step three, collect scientific data. So like, like most things to do with food safety management, uh, data is critical. The quality of the information you're using determines the quality of your work and the outputs from that work. So again, like HACCP and like preventative control plans, collecting and organizing information and data crucial and I'll quickly go through what that data might look at, uh, look like. Next up is conduct the hazard analysis. So guys, you really just need to uh, ask yourself the question, what are the hazards that we need to address through our cleaning program? Try to be as specific as possible. And indeed, you probably already have this work done in your HACCP plan. No need to duplicate it, but no harm just to give it a double check. Next step, step five then, is to risk assess. Okay, so which, which uh, cleaning programs in the context of your hazards are more critical than others? So guys, uh, unless you're with that unusual food business that has an unlimited uh, pot of resources, uh, you need to obviously be discerning and you need to dis discriminate where you put your resources. And risk assessing your cleaning programs is a fantastic way to do that. I'll show you a little model in a moment on how that can be done. Categorize your cleaning programs. Again, in the same vein, uh, you don't need to validate every single cleaning program. Just you can sample from similar cleaning programs, just do one or two, and you work on the assumption it represents all those similar cleaning programs. Step seven, document your cleaning. So actually write down your cleaning procedures, your standard sanitizing operating procedures. You will probably already have them done. Okay, so document your cleaning as you do it now, not as you would like to do it or how you think it should be done, but in fact, how it is done today, if you haven't already done that. Step eight, define your cleaning schedules and uh, the verification approach you're going to take. So how often are these cleaning programs in place? And again, guys, you already have this done. But just for comprehensive uh, presentation, we've included it as a step. Now, I'm not going to go through all these steps in detail in the slides, guys, so um, no need to worry. Step nine is training. You just need to make sure that your employees are trained up to do the cleaning according to the procedure. Okay, so you're standardizing your cleaning operation, removing that, the variation that may exist, and training is crucial for that. Okay, so now you're ready. You can get stuck in, and you can actually start validating your cleaning programs. Okay, and we will talk about that in detail in a moment. From that process, you're going to get some data about the efficiency of your cleaning, and you'll need to analyze that data and make some conclusions from it. 
document those conclusions. And then you may need to go back and make some changes to those cleaning programs to bring them in line with your expectations. Okay, so guys, there are the, there are the steps. Uh, you won't do them all, but certainly there's three or four of them which are critical uh, to do in validation. Okay, so why is validation required? Why do we need to go to all this trouble? Uh, well, it's usually required when legislation or the food safety standards like the GFSI say it is. And the BRC, for example, now specifically requires validation of PRPs. And obviously included in that is cleaning. Uh, validation is required when your risk assessment of your operation identifies cleaning activities as being critical to producing safe food and legal food. Uh, validation is typically required between manufacturing of one product and another, uh, particularly where there's issues of allergens or species cross-contamination. So that's an internally driven uh, requirement, obviously based on legislation, but it's up to you guys to figure that one out um, and as whether validation is required. Validation is normally not required where the cleaning activity is non-critical. So that could be between certain batches of food products which are the same. There's no change in allergens or you know, other issues. Or uh, arguably, uh, non-contact surfaces such as floors and walls. But that's up to the company to, to decide that. But you probably don't want to get into all of this work for surfaces which you know are not that critical from your risk assessment. Okay, so guys, you put together a team. Um, it could be a leader in place. Uh, you could have other members depending on the size and complexity of your organization. It is important that the team members are trained in how to do validation. Should not never, never assume that people know how to do something, uh, particularly something that can be quite complex, like a scientific validation process. So step two then of the process is to find your methodology. And so guys, you can, you can take this uh, this template, this uh, presentation, and you can use it as a starting point and put together your methodology. Don't go into huge detail, just sufficient detail for you to uh, standardize your validation process. Next up is collect scientific data, and this is crucial. You are going to need information to do a validation. And that information, a lot of it will be re uh, readily at hand, from your HACCP study or your preventative control study. Uh, some of it may not be, and you may need to acquire it. Okay. So some of the data you might look at is customer complaints. Now, you may be surprised to see that, but uh, you know, and typically the customer complaint folder is not somebody, uh, something that people rush to every morning to look at. It doesn't normally contain that much by way of good news. Uh, but it is fantastically valuable data because it can tell you, it can point you in directions where perhaps cleaning isn't being effective. So contamination, <coughs> excuse me, complaints, foreign body and matter complaints, they all tell a story. And if you can trend that data and put it together in a good form, that might inform you as to where your risk assessments and validations need to go. Um, information uh, that flows from food recalls, alerts and notifications. So fantastic information and data because these are things that have already gone wrong. You know that they can go wrong. And if you go looking for it, you may find it can inform and give you insight into where you again need to validate. Specific, uh, particularly in the area of allergen uh, recalls because obviously allergens have cornered the market globally on uh, recalls. Um, so analyzing that data, looking at the kind of food products that are associated with those recalls, that can really help you out. So two web links there for you, one from the FDA and the other from the European uh, Union, which contain um, data, a big database of uh, very valuable information and easily searchable and usable. Scientific data uh, will also include research reports. So uh, various sites like uh, EFSA has certain kind of um, you know, scientific studies which does include things like cleaning. Um, so I wouldn't get into, into them in too much detail, but just be aware of them. They may help you, they may inform. Hazard data sheets, yeah, these are a fantastic source of data uh, relating to food safety hazards. Um, good example is the Bad Bug book. I always have to take that one slowly. Um, so uh, there's the link, uh, you um, can click on that and get really fantastic, concise data 
on food safety hazards and indeed on control measures uh, that could be applied. Chemical uh, data sheets uh, are very important. You need to understand the chemicals you're using. Are they appropriate for the job at hand? Has somebody who has knowledge of the application of cleaning chemicals recommended them, devised them? So if you don't already have these data sheets, obtain them and review them, understand what it is that the chemical is doing and is suitable for the purpose. Um, <clears throat> data on machinery, also very important. Uh, you, you need to understand the, the quality, the grade of materials that you're using in your plants. Um, so you also need to understand, are the machines designed for cleaning? Uh, could there be areas or issues with the machine that the manufacturer is making you aware of? So things such as the uh, manuals um, for machines, if they're still around, can be very good. Cleaning methods and materials, uh, you should gather information and data on the types of cleaning methods you're using. The typical methods employed are manual cleaning, foam cleaning, aerial fogging, machine washing, and cleaning in place. I'm sure you're using at least one of those uh, methods. This is all about educating yourself, guys, about understanding what it is you're doing and how you're doing it, because that just makes the quality of your validation a lot better. Okay, analytical and sampling methods. Again, you need to research a little a bit about the methods for sampling um, in your operation, because sampling will be the basis upon which you will generate your data and the testing that's done. Two types of sampling, direct surface sampling uh, or swabbing usually, and then rinse sampling, which uh, is typically used for kind of enclosed pipework systems, uh, filling lines, and uh, kind of gives you the bigger picture for the whole operation. A combination of these two is normally best, but it's not always possible. Okay, um, analytical and sampling methods. So once you've taken your sample, you then need to do some testing on it. And there are a variety of different test methods available out there. I'm not even going to attempt to go through them all. Uh, just mentioned a few there, but you need to figure out what's the appropriate one for your validation process. It could be something as basic as ATP testing, or it could be something a little bit more sophisticated for specific allergen testing. But only you guys know that, uh, and you need to take the time to figure it out. Important point is detection. How sensitive is the test method that you're employing? Is it sufficient to detect the presence of any hazards at the levels that you need? Really important. Best practice, obviously, is to use the test method with the lowest detection level possible. In other words, the most sensitive available methods. Establishing acceptable limits. So guys, this goes back to the basic fundamental point of understanding your objectives for validation. What is the output that you expect from the cleaning program? And once you understand that, you can then uh, set what we call acceptable limits. Okay, so ideally they should have upper and lower control limits or may just simply have lower control limits um, for residuals and other things. Okay, so it uh, should be measurable. You should ideally be able to put a number on it if possible um, and ideally should not be based on visual or subjective data. Okay, so step four then is conduct your hazard analysis. So you need to really identify the hazards, biological, physical, chemical, and allergens. They're the usual suspects. Uh, you'll have that list probably in your HACCP study. So dig it out, take a good look at it, and make sure it's covering those potential hazards arising from the cleaning prerequisite program. Then you need to do a risk assessment. So you need to determine the significance of the hazards and from that, then, you can determine which cleaning programs are important. So the BRC specifically says, for example, the frequency and the methods of cleaning should be based on risk. So that's really important. And in the tool that you can download from our site, there is a fully worked out and built out risk assessment tool for doing cleaning risk assessments. Uh, we'll, we'll take a quick look at it uh, in a moment. Okay. But the, implica the implication in the BRC standard, for example, is that you must document that risk assessment. And in fact, guys, even if the BRC didn't say it or any other standard, 
I would strongly advise you to do a documented risk assessment around cleaning, particularly if you're handling high risk uh, or high care products. To do that risk assessment, uh, you can use a simple risk assessment matrix, uh, say tree by tree, not dissimilar to what you might be using in HACCP. It's important to define what one, two, and three means um, in the context of the probability of occurrence. How likely is it to, for you know, this cleaning program to fail? And what is the impact if the program was to fail? A little point of difference, guys, that in HACCP, you're normally looking at the likelihood of the hazard occurring. But when it comes to cleaning programs, we take um, an FMEA approach, and we're just determining the probability that the cleaning may not be done properly. So, for example, number three could say failure of the cleaning activity is likely to happen often and frequently. As where number one is failure of the cleaning activity is unlikely to happen. It's rare, usually doesn't occur. On the severity side, you could then rate one, two, and three. For example, number three, failure of the cleaning activity is likely to lead to an immediate or grave health impact, a recall, or some sort of regulatory issue. So this is really good, guys. You're really pinning down your risk assessment, clearly defining it, and the risk assessor's job is much easier. Okay, so you can multiply those factors together. That will give you the risk. That risk could be measured in high, medium, or low. Again, define what that means. So if you have a high-risk cleaning program, you should define what the um, outcome of that should be. So for high-risk, you should clean, for example, at a frequent level between products with full verification to include visual inspection, ATP, micro, and chemical. On a low-risk cleaning program, you may decide you need to clean at a minimum level or when it's appropriate and just use purely visual verification to make sure it's been done correctly. Okay, so this, this tool is in the uh, downloaded tool uh, from the resource uh, website. Yeah. And you can then make a list of all your cleaning programs that you have in the operation. You can do your risk assessment, identify the significance of those cleaning programs, and then document what kind of verification um, and actions need to be um, taken for that cleaning program. You can see an, uh, an example of it there on the screen. So we're doing really well now, guys. We're after doing a really nice risk assessment. We understand more about our cleaning programs than we've probably ever understood. And we're comfortable in the fact that we know which ones are significant and we need, we need to keep an eye on them. And they indeed are probably the ones that you want to do your validation on because they're the ones you want to make sure that the cleaning procedures are fit for purpose that they will achieve the controls that you want. That low risk one up there, we probably won't worry about that too much for the moment. That's the right cleaning programs. Yeah, guys, just a small little point. Group them all together, the similar ones together, so you don't have to keep repeating valid validation of the same, essentially the same cleaning activity. Cuts down the amount of work you do. Okay, next job then is to define your cleaning procedure. This is crucial because you need to know how you're cleaning and for the purpose of the training it's essential. So your typical cleaning procedure will include the methods, the standards to be achieved, frequency, chemicals to be used, equipments to be used and any time and temperature specifications which are critical to the efficacy of the program. So get them done on paper and again as I said they're probably already in place. How often will you do them? Define your schedules, Train up your staff, make sure they understand and that they are conducting the cleaning according to the procedure. So this is really important, guys. You're drawing a line between what you say you're doing and what is actually happening in reality during the cleaning job. Important to check that, double check it. Okay, so now you're ready for validation. So you have done your risk assessment. You know which cleaning programs are significant. You're gonna do some validation on them. Uh, you've documented the procedure for cleaning, you've trained your staff up, so you've reduced a lot of the variation that can happen in your um, validation of your program, because you're ready to go. So what you might do then is you'll select a standard operating, uh, sanitizing operating procedure and make that the focus of your validation. You're gonna collect data, guys. You're gonna collect information and data about that cleaning program 
and you want to analyze it and you're going to drop it into a, a little tool that we have uh, which will plot those results out for you in a little graph and i'll explain this graph to you in a moment if you're not familiar already with capability studies okay so what you do now is you start your cleaning you get the guys to do the cleaning as documented and when they're finished you will do your swabs or you do your sampling and you need to have kind of a schedule for this you need to decide you know am i just going to do one cleaning run or am i going to take three cleaning runs over a period of four weeks or how exactly are you going to do that crucial because you want to collect sufficient data to give you a statistically valid uh, result okay so there's no right or wrong answer to this guys it's really down to how you see it uh, but just make sure that you are collecting enough data observe the cleaning when it's happening to make sure that the procedure has been followed you want to know that because you want to know your data is, is valid for the actual cleaning um, activity. Okay, so uh, let's say that you that your verification is a simple ATP swab in this case, just, to, just for example. So the cleaning is done, you'll observe it. At the end of the cleaning, you're going to get your ATP kit out and you're going to do some swabs. It's going to give you some results and you're going to pop those results into the table in the Excel workbook. So you can see there on the uh, right, we have results ranging from 50 to 60. We can see our maximum allowable result is 200. That's really important, guys, because that's telling you when you're out of control. Once it exceeds 200, then you need to um, consider that maybe the cleaning program isn't um, fully valid. Okay, So results ranging from 200 down to about, uh, I can see 50 there, quite a spread, um, but that's good. Pop the data in there now, and next step is analyze the results. So the tool will plot those results out in what's called a histogram. And it's really just a graph that, that uh, visually represents the distribution or the variation of the data collected. Uh, most processes have what we call a normal distribution. Um, won't go into detail what exactly what that is. Uh, but we can see we have a couple of data points which are fairly close to the um, to the uh, upper allowed limits. So that might just make us a little bit concerned. It might just tell us that the process, the cleaning procedure, is too variable and it's not really up to the job. And you can see, and the great thing about this is you can see that visually. But there are some other measures like CP uh, index and CPK. They're just measures of process capability, guys. Don't worry about the statistics behind it. Uh, the chart will show it up and I will show you in red or, or whatever color when the process is statistically not valid. Okay. So once you get that result back and that data comes back to you, uh, you need to make some decisions. You need to decide a very simple question. Is this cleaning process a valid process? In other words, is it capable of achieving our objectives? or the criteria for that cleaning program? Two possible answers. Uh, the result indicates that the procedures are capable of consistently delivering the results. Then you can deem that to be a validated and effective cleaning program. Very good, so you can document that. Put all your documentation away, and next time the order comes in, they might well be pretty impressed with, with, with your work. Okay. However, if the results indicate your CP uh, value, your CPK value is out is um, is is too variable. Uh, if it indicates that, then you need to draw the conclusion that the process is not valid. It hasn't been validated fully. Okay. So either way, you are on top of what you're doing. You're in control. You know what's happening. In the event that it's not in control or not valid document all of that information and again in the downloadable tool you will find a couple of tabs like the one on the screen there which will prompt you to record all the relevant information and data including your decision which is crucially important okay. in the event that it's not valid then you need to um, decide what you do okay you, you need to decide well how important is this do we have in place a situation where our cleaning program is not capable of preventing some significant food safety issue reaching the market? Okay, so you may need to modify the procedure. And um, that would be the typical outcome from that, uh, or you may want to repeat the validation process to make sure that 
it actually was is giving you valid information. So if the procedure is not capable, modify the cleaning methods and correct the issue and then repeat the process. Really important guys, you can't you can't just modify a procedure and assume that it will do the job. You have to go back, start from ground zero essentially and, and work away to get that uh, result, that desired result, which is a validated cleaning program. Also, if for any reason, and it, it's quite an often uh, typical occurrence that the cleaning method is modified in any way. So let's, for example, say you start sourcing chemicals from a different supplier. You may want a policy in place that revalidation must be done. If, for example, um, a new employees come into place, um, after their training, again, you may want to do some validation. There could be a whole range of scenarios around which you may want to do that. Again, not dissimilar to your approach in HACCP or preventative control plans. Okay. So, guys, we're after going through there uh, in a lightning speed, 13 steps that you can take to validate cleaning programs. There's a lot more behind it than what we've covered today, but much of that information and data will be contained in the white paper. So, Simon, I'll hand back to you um, if that's okay. Yeah, if you can uh, stop, come back in the webinar room and click this stop sharing uh, the icon and switch your webcam on. Uh, so, close your PowerPoint and I'll close the PowerPoint. Yeah, in the webinar room. Um, Click this the icon, you know, the share icon to stop sharing. The, uh, thanks very much anyway, George. If, if you can do that in the webinar room, yeah, and then switch your webcam back on. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, thanks very much, George. Yeah, a lot to get through in, in 40 minutes, but it's just the, the high-level ov overview. There's a lot more detail on the slides, and like you say, in the white paper itself, even more detail, and then on top of that, the, the actual practical tools that you can use. So thanks very much, George. Uh, I'm sure all the attendees will find it well worthwhile uh, and will help them. Right, should we pick through some of the questions? Um, there have been quite a few. Sheena is asking or asked what certifications should be in place for disinfectants UK stroke EU and is there anyone that also covers sanitizers so disinfectants and sanitizer um, standards certification okay I'm, I'm not aware of any specific certification standards required for clean chemicals uh, there may well be, I just wouldn't be that familiar with the UK, but uh, it's quite possible that certain departments, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, um, may have a an approved list of those chemicals. That's not unusual that those lists would exist. Um, your customer may have requirements that your chemical supplier is, say, BRC certified. Um, but as regards to specific certification, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh... And Maureen, is cleaning validation applicable only to product contact surfaces? Uh, not necessarily. Um, I mean, it could be it could be related to the environment, uh, very high risk uh, controlled environments. You could have a, um, a fogging procedure which is designed to actually kill airborne bacteria. Um, so that could possibly, so it really depends on the nature of the process, the operation, and the risks involved. Okay. Right. Uh, Mike Z, uh, how do you best validate the chemicals that are used in cleaning, for example, when you switch to a new chemical company? Oh, I, in that case, I would just strongly recommend going back and starting from zero. Something significant like a cleaning chemical change will change the whole you know the whole game so you really have to go back to the beginning yeah well even if it's a like for like uh you know sort of chemical yeah uh again um if if in your risk assessment you've identified a cleaning program as being significantly high risk uh i would not operate on the assumption that it's like for like i don't believe any two chemicals from different suppliers would ever be like for like Although they may be identical in their intended purpose, they may not be identical in their chemical makeup, and you really need to start start at the beginning. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, good. Uh, Stuart, when collecting scientific data, what recommendations do you have for control of cleaning with false positives, or for dealing with false positives? Uh, okay, so false positives, so up, um, this would be in relation to actually your, your testing, is it, of your data? I, I think so, yeah, when collecting scientific data, what recommendations, recommendations do you have for cleaning? Okay, well, dealing well, with false positives. In terms of verification, I mean, if you're just verifying on a routine basis the, the cleaning operation, you get a false positive, your policy might, be, might well be just to repeat the test. Um, if you get a double uh, um, uh, negative reason, uh, results, then you will have actions. Um, uh, to be honest, I have really considered, if you have a false positive, um, you probably just need to review the whole testing approach. You should have, obviously, a control there that lets you know there's a false positive. Um, okay. No, it's, it's right. quite... Um, okay, Cam, Cam D, one question. When doing a validation using swabbing to test TPC, is it better to take the swabs before cleaning to see if the cleaning is, is often enough after cleaning, but before sanitizing to see or after cleaning and sanitizing? So when's the best, the best time? Um... Yeah, it, it, so it, again, it really depends on what you're trying to, to do. I mean, if you take, uh, swabs prior to cleaning are needless to say they're going to be quite a high load um if you do it after say using a detergent and you remove most of the styling that would make sense because it tells you how effective your um your your disinfection stage is which is crucial now it will tell you what kind of blood reduction you're getting um from the use of the chemical using that method so that would be valuable data uh time consuming and costly uh, most companies will just go, just go for, for to see what the actual final end result is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Marco, are there any guidelines or sampling methods on surfaces, equipment, machinery, and or food? Are there any guidelines or sampling? Yeah. Best yeah. advice. Best advice you could get there is to talk to your laboratory. Most food companies will use an external. Uh, accredited laboratory, which will have specialist microbiologists working for them, um, and they're normally the best people to. Them. They know your process, your products, and they'll they'll work with you on that. Okay, uh, Susie, are there any studies I can use as validation for keeping the same sanitizer? Mm, not that I'm aware of. No, no. Okay, Bria B, how does validation with a contract cleaning company differ from what you presented here when you don't have a direct responsibility for training of the cleaning employees? Okay, so if you utilize a contract company, uh, it's not strictly correct to say you don't have no responsibility. You absolutely do. The fact that it's a contract company doing the cleaning doesn't change that. Uh, you would still absolutely take the same approach. You would need to make sure that the cleaning uh, it is effective for those contractors as much as you want for your own employees. You can work on the assumption that the contractor is doing it. I wouldn't. Uh, from personal experience over years, I would never uh, would just rely upon that assumption. Right. Okay. I'm not sure if this is a repeat, George. Uh, Blossom, ATP swabbing or ProClean swabs shall be done before sanitation or after sanitation. Uh, yes, they can be done both, yeah, for the same answer. Yeah. Okay. Right. So then are you checking if, if, so are we saying disinfecting and then sanitize? So are we checking the effect, the effectiveness of the disinfection if we do it yes. before sanitization? Yes, exactly. Um, so after, after using your detergent, you'll get most of the bulk removed, um, the gross soiling. What you'll be left with then is a certain level of bacteria which needs to be reduced. Um, so if you can measure that uh, before the sanitizing or uh, disinfection stage and post, that will tell you the effectiveness of that particular stage of the cleaning process, which is critical. Okay. Uh, Chris, can the principles of validation still apply for manual dry cleaning pro processes? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, very often, um, machinery which uh, could be difficult to clean, 
uh, there will be a manual cleaning process. So it is very often as critical as the more automated processes. Okay, thanks. And Susi, again, what should be the revalidation schedule if nothing on my procedures changed? Uh, sorry, Sam, just repeat that. Uh, so basically, uh, she's validated uh, the process. Uh, how, how frequently should you redo that if nothing has changed? Oh, okay. Well, again, that's really down to the policies which the company sets in developing its uh, food safety management system. So revalidation of PRPs, um, again, you know, it could depend on the risk of the PRP. Um, you know, a, lot, a lot of companies will do a lot of revalidation um, on an annual basis or two, two yearly basis. Okay. Uh, Julie, in low risk food, raw meat, is it okay to validate with ATP only? We have already validated ATP as a monitoring method. I would think I would I would suggest that it probably is yeah um, for that particular type of product. Again, you just probably need to be careful if if the plant is ha handling different species. You may have a concern about cross species contamination. In that case, right. between uh, production runs, if they're on the same line. So in that particular example, you may your risk assessment might have to find it even more sensitive or more frequent. Um, uh, Verification for sure, and your validation may need to be more robust as well. Okay. Uh, well, Bria is asking, this is not related to um, a technical question per se. Uh, the white paper, yes, uh, we'll send a link with the email, the follow up email, we'll, we'll send a link directly, a hyperlink to the white paper and, and all the templates. But also, there's, in the slide deck, there is uh, the, the link is also mentioned there as well. So don't worry about that, Priya. Uh, Sheena, is not is not the initial loading levels on the equipment as important to ascertain as this may affect your results and surely the validation needs to determine the highest loading is reduced to a safe level too? Yes, you, you need to formulate what exactly you want to achieve, what the outcome is. Uh, some companies take what's called the worst case scenario and they will you know, do the validation with just the highest load possible. So in that particular case, you may decide that you need that level of detail to validate for sure. That may not always be the case. Uh, for, for other scenarios, you may just be satisfied with just determining the final outcome over a statistically valid sample. Okay, uh, just a bit of positive feedback here. Laura, thank you. Just went through food safety plan training and there was much confusion between validation and verification. Verification. This helped. So you managed to do in 45 minutes <laughs> what others have failed to do. Um, see, Maureen, do others use swab templates to standardize the area swabbed flattish surfaces? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. of course, uh, when it comes to uh, developing your procedures for validation, you will look at sampling procedures. And again, it's good practice to define the sampling area if you're swabbing. Um, and make sure that the person doing the swabbing is trained and understands how to do that, because the, the procedure must be repeatable. So if one person is swabbing uh, 10 by 10 and the next person is doing 20 by 20, uh, your validation process is, is open window. So again, if you look at the white paper, they will detail more about that. Okay, more questions. There's been a few questions about the frequency of uh, validation, but I think we've answered that. Uh, Bruce, do you recommend ingredient grouping strategies for CV studies where the grouping is comprised of the highest risk components? Yes, yeah, I mean, you, you could certainly do that in a very general sense, yes. Um, there may be local concrete reasons why you might want to break it down a bit more, but in general, the answer to that would be yes. Uh, mainly to avoid re uh, repeating the work that you've done. And again, over time as well, I mean, as you do more validations, you're, you're adding to the body of information and knowledge that you have. So you can always reduce that as well in time to come. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Maristella, if the methodology for allergen has a limit of detection 
how can we validate a cleaning process? Okay, so I think sense? yeah, the question might be saying is that if a test method employed is does not is only sensitive down to a particular level, <clears throat> it, uh, the assumption may be that there's still the presence of that allergen there. Right. Um, no, the reality is you can only operate in the realms of current technology and science. And in most, in most codes of practice, uh, retailers will allow, allow you to operate to the best available um, technology that's out there and work on that basis. Right. Okay. Okay, that's clear. Uh, Lum, is there a sample size needed to do the validation? Again, it really depends on the uh, the operation. You could refer to sampling plans. Uh, the BS have standards on how to have a statistically valid sampling plan. So you could get in, into all that area. Uh, guys, I, I, I would probably just start with some good um, intuition, you know, and uh, start out with some sampling plan that's relatively uh, sufficient. You'll soon know whether it's valid or not. Uh, by the construction of the graph. If you don't get a normal distribution curve or what looks something like it, you probably aren't sampling enough. Okay. Uh, I think the, the, some of the questions are repeating ones uh, that we've already covered. Uh, okay, bless you. Does the use of sanitizers such as chlorine, chlorine amplify the DNA and might affect the RLU when using ATP tests? Uh, will the count result be higher or lower than when tested after cleaning only? Wow. I don't know if you got that, George. No, I, I understand the question. Uh, I don't know the answer to it. I wouldn't be that much an expert in the, in the okay. science. Um, that the rapid testing, I don't know is okay. the short answer. Right. Um, I could guess I have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. <laughs> right. Uh, I think we've managed to, uh, I've managed to pick it up, uh, I've scrolled all the way to the top now. We're at, at Teresa saying, have a nice weekend. So I think um, what we'll do then, um, we will, well, one more actually, Bruce. Are TOC methods equivalent to allergen swabs? TOC, I, I think again, you'll probably just have to do a, a, a validation on that um, yeah. correlation between the two. And most companies will do that. Okay. I think what we'll do, George, uh, we'll we'll leave it there. Um, okay. Uh, it's been it's been great. Um, thanks for sharing your time and knowledge and uh, the resources you've got there, the white paper and, and the templates, uh, the tools, and uh, will be fantastic resource. So almost two thousand people will be taking advantage of that. So uh, thanks for your time today, George, and for your continued support with these webinars at Safe Food Three Hundred and Sixty. Uh, and hope you have a great weekend. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Okay. Right, that was George Howlett, CEO from Safe Food 360. Like I say, I will follow up with an email. I know some of you asked in the sidebar. I'll follow up with an email um, within a couple of hours with the slides, the uh, webinar recording, and the certificate of attendance if you don't get it. I've actually loaded the certificate in the sidebar. Please don't uh, ask me to put your name on. I can't put your name on it. Uh, there's too many of you. You either have to print it and sign it, or you have to open it in a uh, uh, image editing software such as Paint and just type your name on it. I don't have the time, unfortunately, to personalize the certificates. So it's been great. Again, uh, next week we've got, uh, as I say, Vladimir Suchinsky with the... Um, Problem Solving Tools, that's a paid uh, webinar, $97 to four hours. Um, you get some tools and templates from that and some practical education. Uh, and then we'll be back the week after with Robert Rogers from Metal Toledo. And Robert will be doing a webinar, Ensuring Readable Date, date Lock Code Information, which is vital for uh, not mixing uh, products up, which is a serious consumer safety issue. Right, thanks very much. Uh, happy Friday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, hope the sun's shining on you. Keep safe, and uh, I'll see you soon. Have a great 